Welcome to the History of North America. I'm Mark Vinette. As we approach the end of our deep dive into England's Tudor period and its influence on North America, let's examine the immeasurable contribution made by an Englishman on one of the continent's main languages and culture. Although this gentleman never visited the continent per se, his words flowed across the ocean onto the immense territory to greatly impact its means of communication. Let's explore the life, deeds, and works of this Tudor-era titan of history, William Shakespeare. English actor, playwright, poet, and London theatre owner from the early 1590s to 1613, William Shakespeare, known as the Bard of Avon, authored at least 37 plays and collaborated on several more. He also wrote 154 sonnets, two long narrative poems, and a few other verses. In 1613, William Shakespeare retired from the London theatre and returned to his family home in Stratford, Warwickshire, England, where he died three years later. The circumstances of his death remain an enigma to this day. The posthumous first folio of Shakespeare's plays was published in 1623, including Henry V. Let's highlight the play's famous speech, once more, onto the breach. This edition of Timeline presents Henry V, Shakespeare's Once More Onto the Breach. The writing of William Shakespeare's celebrated play Henry V is situated on the timeline at the end of the 16th century in 1599. To put this in perspective, Shakespeare's plays were first performed on stage in 1592, and he retired as a playwright in 1613. The siege of the French port of Harfleur in Normandy, France was a military action which occurred during the Hundred Years' War at the beginning of the Agincourt campaign. The siege began on August 18, 1415 and ended when the town surrendered to the English on September 22. In Shakespeare's account, King Henry delivers a rousing speech to his soldiers at the climactic moment of the battle when the defensive walls of Harfleur were finally breached by English cannon. Once more, onto the breach, dear friends, once more, or close the wall up with our English dead. In peace, there's nothing so becomes a man as modest stillness and humility. But when the blast of war blows in our ears, then imitate the action of the tiger. Stiffen the sinews, summon up the blood, disguise fair nature with hard-favored rage. Then, lend the eye a terrible aspect. Let it pry through the portage of the head like the brass cannon. Let the brow o'erwhelm it as fearfully as doth a galled grot or hang and jutty his confounded base, swilled with the wild and wasteful ocean. Now, set the teeth and stretch the nostril wide. Hold hard the breath and bend up every spirit to his full height. On, on, you noblest English, whose blood is fed from fathers of war proof. Fathers that, like so many Alexanders, have in these parts from morn till even fought and sheathed their swords for lack of argument. Dishonor not your mothers. Now attest that those whom you called fathers did beget you. Be copy now to men of grosser blood and teach them how to war. And you, good yeoman, whose limbs were made in England, Show us here the metal of your pasture. Let us swear that you are worth your breeding, which I doubt not. For there is none of you so mean and base that hath not noble luster in your eyes. I see you stand like greyhounds in the slips, straining upon the start. The game's afoot. Follow your spirit, and upon this charge cry, God for Harry, England, and St. George. This concludes our rendition of Henry V. Shakespeare's Once More Onto the Breach. We hope you have enjoyed this presentation and look forward to meeting you again soon along the timeline. The Battle of Agincourt was a major English victory and is the centerpiece of the 1599 play Henry V by William Shakespeare. Let's learn more about this famous battle between future North American colonial rivals. This edition of Titans of History presents the Battle of Agincourt and King Henry V. 
Henry V was King of England from 1413 until his death at the age of 35. Son of King Henry IV, he was the second English monarch who came from the House of Lancaster. As a young prince, he gained valuable military experience fighting rebellions against his father's enemies. As king, he embarked on war with France in the ongoing Hundred Years' War between the two nations. He claimed the title of King of France through his great-grandfather, Edward III. King Henry first invaded northern France in 1415, following the failure of negotiations with the French. His military success at the port of Harfleur led to his famous victory at Agincourt and saw him come close to conquering France. The Battle of Agincourt was a major English victory that took place on St. Crispin's Day. Henry led his troops into battle and participated in hand-to-hand -hand fighting. This battle is notable for the use of the English longbow in very large numbers, with English and Welsh archers forming most of Henry's army. The battle is the centerpiece of the play Henry V by William Shakespeare. Henry's astonishing victory at Agincourt against the numerically superior French army crippled and demoralized France. After long negotiations with the French King Charles VI, the Treaty of Troyes recognized Henry as regent and heir apparent to the French throne, and he was subsequently married to Charles's daughter, Catherine of Valois. Following Henry's sudden and unexpected death in France two years later, he was succeeded by his infant son, who reigned both England and France as Henry VI. We hope you have enjoyed this presentation and look forward to sharing history with you again soon. On the morning of October 25th, 1415, shortly before the Battle of Agincourt during the Hundred Years' War, English King Henry V made a brief speech to the English army under his command, emphasizing the justness of his claim to the French throne and harking back to the memory of previous defeats the English kings had inflicted on the French. Let's enjoy Shakespeare's rendition of this celebrated Band of Brothers speech. This edition of Titans of History presents Henry V, Shakespeare's Band of Brothers. On the morning of October 25th, 1415, shortly before the Battle of Agincourt during the Hundred Years' War, Henry V made a brief speech to the English army under his command, emphasizing the justness of his claim to the French throne and harking back to the memory of previous defeats the English kings had inflicted on the French. In Shakespeare's account, King Henry begins his speech in response to his cousin Westmoreland's expressions of dismay at the English army's lack of troop strength. Henry rouses his men by expressing his confidence that they would triumph, and that the band of brothers fighting that day would be able to boast each year on St. Crispin's Day of their glorious battle against the French. What's he that wishes so? My cousin, Westmoreland? No, my fair cousin. If we are marked to die, we are enough to do our country loss. And if to live, the fewer men, the greater share of honor. God's will, I pray thee, wish not one man more. By Jove, I am not covetous for gold, nor care I who doth feed upon my cost. It yearns me not if men my garments wear. Such outward things dwell not in my desires. But if it be a sin to covet honor, I am the most offending soul alive. No faith, my cuz, wish not a man from England. God's peace, I would not lose so great an honor as one man more methinks would share from me for the best hope I have. Oh, do not wish one more. Rather proclaim it, Westmoreland, through my host, that he which hath no stomach to this fight, let him depart. His passport shall be made and crowns for convoy put into his purse. We would not die in that man's company that fears his fellowship to die with us. This day is called the Feast of Crispian. He that outlives this day and comes safe home will stand a tiptoe when this day is named and rouse him at the name of Crispian. He that shall live this day and see old age will yearly on the vigil feast his neighbors and say, Tomorrow is Saint Crispian. Then will he strip his sleeve and show his scars and say, These wounds I had on Crispian's day. Old men forget Yet all shall be forgot, but he'll remember, 
with advantages, what feats he did that day. Then shall our names, familiar in his mouth as household words, Harry the King, Bedford, and Exeter, Warwick and Talbot, Salisbury and Gloucester, be in their flowing cups freshly remembered. This story shall the good man teach his son, and Crispin Crispian shall ne'er go by from this day to the ending of the world, but we in it shall be remembered. We few, we happy few, we band of brothers, for he today that sheds his blood with me shall be my brother, but he ne'er so vile this day shall gentle his condition, and gentlemen in England now abed shall think themselves accursed they were not here, and hold their manhoods cheap whilst any speaks that fought with us upon St. Crispin's Day. We hope you have enjoyed this presentation and look forward to sharing history with you again soon. I'm Mark Vinette, and I hope you're enjoying the ride.